Let's find out if it's going to be exciting. Let's see if this works. No, nope, still doesn't. All right. Um, yes. So, um, start here. Um, I'm a, I have a background in uh, network development, so server software and that sort of stuff. So when in whenever it was, um, futures came started to come around and made uh, network development, the whole select and poll stuff much easier. Um, I, obviously were, I obviously was very excited. And um, looking at the definition of a future, it's all very obvious and trivial. There's a poll function that you call and keep calling, or someone keeps calling. I don't need to care about that, um, until there's a result. But then this happened. And um, I was, what? Um, I should probably look into this, because also what, what happens is this then trickles through into other things. This is the read trade from uh, Tokyo, and you see self also is this mysterious pin thing. Um, now, this was in 2018, so that's five years ago. I still haven't looked into it. Um, and I figured I tricked myself into doing this by proposing a talk. And <laughs> apparently the program committee also hadn't looked into it and thought, <laughs> yes, let's do that. So. What are these mysterious pin things? Um, we need to start by talking about move by what I call mem copy. That's not the official term. I made that up, well, yesterday. Um, and this is the idea that the Rust compiler is allowed to move things around in memory as much as it wants to, and that all the types can be copied. That is, you can just take it, their bits and move them from here to there, and they're still valid values. Right? Well, that's trivial for something like a U size. Um, a 12 is a 12, no matter where it lives. Um, it's also true for more complicated things, like this thing here, which has an array and a U-size. You can still just take it, move it, it's fine. Um, it's also true for really complicated things. There's like complicated types in there, TCP stream probably is not trivial. Um, there's an arc in there as well. So, but still, the rule is you can move it from wherever it lived to somewhere else. Um, and it's still fine. Side note, um, this is where copy comes from, sort of, because the difference between moving and copying is really just that in the move scenario, which is what we call the move semantics, wherever it used to live can't be used anymore, whereas if the type is copy, you can still use it. Um, so move semantics, which you've all heard of because the compiler told you about it, um, means that um, you create a value and then you can move it somewhere else. So in this case here, we're creating a stream, um, which technically is created inside this TCP stream connect function and then moved to us, so that's already a move. And we do the same with uh, the metrics, which uses the default trait, which also again creates a value inside the trait method and moves it out. And then we're moving the whole thing into this TCP or TLS stream enum thing. Um, and again, we're moving it around. So um, we can do even more fancy things. We can move it from the stack, because that's what we did um, with all these let things. We can move it onto the heap. Again, it's just, a, it's just a move. We take it from the stack and move it to somewhere in the heap. And then we can take that pointer that we just made, because an arc is a pointer, really, and move that. Now, here's an important thing. Um, once we move this on the heap, um, and we're moving the pointer, we're not actually moving the object anymore, or the value. Um, that stays where it is, right? So in this case here, um, we're making an arc, which is a pointer and a number, um, and we're pushing it onto the end of a vector. Now we're only moving that arc, but the TCP or TLS thing stays where it is. That's important, because we'll use that later. Um, but you can still, if you have a pointer on a heap, or wherever, because you can also obviously have a pointer to something on the stack, you can still move it. You just have to be a bit sneaky about it. Um, and this is what uh, core or std mem has this function here, swap, which basically takes two mutable pointers and just exchanges whatever is there. And as you can see here, it actually does exactly a, a move. It copies the bits, right? So pointer read. Um, reads whatever is behind the pointer into this A, from X to A, and then we later write it back to B. Um, so again, this is a move. So crucially, we can move things 
by memcopy, if we have an unadulterated own T, so not a T that has been stuck into a pointer, but an actual T, or we have a mutable uh, reference to it. And why is this important? Because this whole thing is the reason why we can use the stack so much in Rust, right? In C or in Java and things, what always happens is you make a value, you move it into a allocated bit on the heap. We only need to do that on Rust, and the reason we can do that, we can away, get away with it, is this uh, move by mem copy. So this is really great, except there's always something. And in this case, it's something called self-referential struct, right? So here's a, a trivial example. Uh, we have a buffer, which is just an array of bytes, and we want to keep, keep track of, like we want to read into that buffer, and we want to keep track of what part of it we have filled. So we just do a U8 slice. Um, and that slice is supposed to point into that buffer, right? So it looks like this. The buffer, and then filled has, uh, it's a slice, so it has two pointers, one where it starts and the length of it. Now, if we move this thing, um, we move the actual bits, which means that slice there, which is just two pointers, points to where it used to point. That doesn't get updated because you just copy bits, right? So that's gonna be bad. Um, and this is why you can't actually do that. This is one of the uh, features of the whole lifetime thing. Um, well, you can do it, but then you have to do unsafe code and then you're on your own. Um, so let's say we don't actually need that, but there's another use case uh, that actually needs this, which is asking functions and blocks. And because what they do is, um, this isn't coroutines or threads or anything, right? so they don't have their own stack and, and it's all expensive. What actually happens is the compiler sort of desugars this into a state machine, which is a sort of an enum. And every time um, you call a wait, it generates a state for that. And with that state, it keeps all the, all the variables and the things that it needs later. Right? So in this case, um, the first state is before we actually start. Because if you call an async function, it doesn't do anything. It just gives you this future thing back, which is that, uh, that thing here. So the start basically needs to keep all your arguments. And then when we call the, f oh yeah, so and then what we're doing here is we're basically just taking this, uh, this bytes vector and split it into two bits, which both of those are references. Um, and then we're just using them across await points here, right? So for the first await point, um, we need to remember for later the actual vector, because we need that at the bottom. There's a send message at the bottom. And we need write. Now write is a reference into that message, which also lives into, in that, inside of that uh, enum. So we've made a self-referential well, structure enum. So that's kind of bad. So how do we fix this? Well, so what we said is um, we can't do this because we can't but if we move around the, the enum here, which will happen, right? Your runtime will just put it here and put it there and do stuff with it. Um, so, but we can't move it. So we just need to make sure you can't move it. And that's exactly what the pin does. Um, this pin is just the thing that, that makes it impossible to move the struct around. And so you can have it be self-referential. Again, the, the main usage, and this is also why this happened to appear in future here, is for async functions. That's why we need it, so that you can make async functions. So that's why it appeared there. Now, how does it actually does do that? Um, first, the important thing here is that pins are for pointers. So you always pin pointers, you never pin values. Like a pin U32 isn't a thing. Um, you always pin pointers. So like references are pointers, mutual refer or mutable references are pointers, but also things like boxes and arcs and RCs and whatnot. And if you make your own pointer type, then that might also be pinned, right? So you could have a, a complex uh, struct that contains pointers, then that could also, no, hang on, that's not true. Um, but you can make a smart pointer that has things, and then that might also be pinned. Um, why does that work? Well, so we said that there's two ways you can move things, or move by memcopy, as I called it, things. One is you need a, just an own T. Well, we don't have that, because the T has been moved into the pointer into the pin. So we can't get to that, so that can't move. But we also cannot call, um, 
we cannot get a, mut a mutable pointer or a mutable reference to that value because the pin just doesn't let you do this, right? If you write your type, you decide what you do. And the pin just doesn't allow you to do that, which means by just being this little thing without any magic or anything, it just stopped it from being possible um, to move that struct around. That's all the pin does really, except hang on, if you look at the pin, um, there's this. So it implements dref-mat, which I just said it doesn't. Well, that's just weird. But I wasn't lying, I was just not telling you the whole story, which is this. Um, it actually only implements this when the target type, so that's our T, uh, for the pointer is something called unpin. Great, now what's that? Um, unpin is a trait, obviously, because it's a trait bound. And uh, crucial here, because that leads to confusion, unpin is implemented by the type your pointer points to, not by the pointer. The pointer doesn't care, the type it points to needs to be unpin or not, right? And what it says is, actually, just move me around, it's fine. Because most, uh, most types, as we've seen, can be moved just fine. I mean, that's a fundamental, uh, fundamental principle of Rust, that you can do that. So most types actually can be moved around, and we don't really need this pin thing, we just need this for these weird self-referential things. So, um, unpin is in fact an auto trait, which means the compiler uh, implements it automatically for all types that it thinks are unpin. That's the same way that sync and send work. Um, and the way this works is that basically everything is unpin. All the built-in types, like your U-size, obviously, you can just move a U-size around. Um, all of these are unpin. Complex types are unpin, so structs and enums, if everything in, inside of them is unpin, that's the same as for sentencing. So really, everything is unpinned, then why are we doing this? Well, there's a thing called phantom pinned, which is one of these marker traits, like phantom, uh, was it phantom uh, data, whatever it was called, um, which, is not, which is not unpinned. And this is really weird, so it's not unpinned, but you know. Um, so if you want to build a self-referential struct, then what you do is you just make phantom pinned part of your struct, and then magically it doesn't Oh, it's not unpinned anymore, which means um, it cannot be moved around. Oh, hang on. No, how do you get back? There we go. So, in summary, pointer types can be pinned by sticking them inside a pin struct. This pinning blocks the move by memcopy by blocking access to representations of the value or pointers to value that would make it possible to move them. But it only does that if the type itself shouldn't be moved. Otherwise, it basically does nothing. And because the letter, the you can just move stuff around, is almost, almost always true, you don't actually need to care about this, which also means you cannot read up on it for five years. But now, um, well, actually, well, like, we still have to implement futures, maybe. So we still have to do these. We still have these pins and things, and we need to deal with them. Now, let's say um, we want to wrap a TCP stream, and we want to add some metrics to it, because that's always coming up, and it's always annoying, but we need to do it. So we make a struct that contains the TCP stream. It contains a TCP metrics, which for the rest of this we don't actually care about, um, and we need to implement async read, async write. Let's just look at read. Um, so there is the, the method that we had before, and now we get the self as this pinned uh, pointer. And all the rest is just not important, because what we really want to do is we want to call Paul read on the stream member of the struct. That's it, right? Now how do we do this? Well, let's go and have a look at TCP stream in the documentation, and hooray, it implements unpin. So actually, we don't need to care about all of this which means um, the pin implements DRF mat for um, the pin TCP stream, which means we can just do this. Um, we can just take a mutable reference to the member. It just works because DRF magic and things. Um, so now we have a mutual, a mutable pointer or reference to stream. And now we need to just call Paul read of it, except we don't read the mutual mutable. Uh, reference to the stream, we need the pin of that. 
Now let's have a look at the pin documentation. And there's an actual pin, uh, there's an actual new function, which um, isn't even unsafe or anything. You can just use it. But if you look at the trade bound for the impl block, um, it requires target to be unpin, which we are. So I guess we can just do this then. And we can, so that just works. Which then you can turn into just one line and you're done. Um, it's also important to point out here that uh, pin is one of these uh, transparent structs, which basically means all of this, what we're doing here, all the pin new and the this and the that, it all goes away. The, point, the compiler just compiles it away. So it's really just a call on Paul read on that uh, inner, inner thing. Well, that's nifty. So what was all the fuss about then? Um, let's make this generic, right? So we want a metric stream for not just TCP stream, but for anything, because we're doing TLS, obviously. Um, um, now, we only need T to be async read for implementing async read, obviously. Let's just do the same thing, see what happens. Well, obviously, this happens. Um, and the compiler rightfully tells us that um, our T isn't unpin. The story goes a bit further because also, obviously, if T isn't unpin, you also can't do the mud self stream thing there. Um, so that doesn't work. We need to do something else. And what we need to do is something called pin projection. And um, well, this is Rust, so we don't do it ourselves. We just go to uh, Grace.io and search for something. And there's two crates here, uh, pin project and pin project light. Uh, the difference between the two of them is basically pin project can do more things and like weird sort of um, side effecty things that we don't really have time for now and also haven't read up on. Um, so basically always uh, you want to use pin project light and um, like if you use something like Tokyo, you have that anyway because Tokyo is using it. Um, so just use it, doesn't even change your, um, your de uh, dependency count. Um, so what does that do? It gives us a macro called pin project, and we just uh, wrap our struct definition inside that macro, and we mark the members of that struct that we want to have pinned references for later down with this, uh, with this attribute pin. Um, now what this macro does under the hood is it creates a, um, like a little shadow structure it looks exactly the same, but for each of those uh, things that we mark with pin, it actually has a pinned thingy thing. So what you can now do is, uh, you see this down in the, in the, in, in the uh, implementation block, um, you just call project on self, which is a function that the pin project also gives you. And this then gives you a struct back, this sort of shadow struct um, that we got, which consists of a pinned mutual reference to mutable reference, I'll get this eventually, um, to the pinned members and just a regular uh, mutable reference to all the rest. So we can just call stream on this, which gives us a, um, a pinned mod self, and we're good. We can just call that. And that essentially is it. Again, if you're doing unsafe things, then you're on your own. You need to read things and whatnot, and I guess have lots of sec faults. Um, there's one thing I want to say in the end, um, which is what happens in the end, which is if you want to implement drop on your metric stream thing. Um, now, what happens if you do this, you get an error saying that um, there's a conflicting implementation. And um, what is basic, what pin project basically does is it prohibits you from implementing drop because implementing drop on a pinnable struct is dangerous um, because in drop you get this um, mud self, so this uh, mutable reference, but this self may actually be pinned at this point, right? So it may actually be that you are not, you couldn't move it, you shouldn't move it, but the compiler gives you the, the, the sort of tools to actually move stuff because you can, as we saw with swap, you can move things around. So the easiest way is to just not be allowed to do implement drop. And if you actually sort of have to walk around this, if you need drop, then um, you need to be very careful to not actually move things um, in your drop implementation, which this being Rust 
makes it a little tricky. So just remember, don't do drop. And that really already is it. Yeah, thank you, Martin. And now I'm really curious whether somebody has questions about this or are you like completely overwhelmed? Oh, no, the mic is already in the right place. There we go. <laughs> um, you have a question about the drop. So that compiler error seemed like you just cannot implement drop. Is there some way, like an unsafe way or something to implement drop? Uh, so the, the, this pin project thing is just basically um, like it helps you with doing the, this projection. Um, sort of magically, right? You can, of course, uh, do this yourself. So you can implement a function that takes a pinned mod self and turns that into a pinned whatever, the, 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 like the, TC, the, the T that we had, right? The stream thing. You can do that. Um, that requires unsafe code. Um, and then if you do it that way, then you can do whatever you want. You can implement drop. It's not a problem. It's basically this pin project is just for all the normal uh, cases. You can just uh, get away with doing nothing. Excellent. There was another question. Oh, 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 God. I'm running away from you. Hello. So uh, what I was thinking is that so most types are unpinned, right? Yeah. But a, uh, like an async function that's an arbitrary like future, that might or might not be so referential depending on the contents of the async function, right? So is then the future from that's generated as syntactic sugar from an async function always not unpinned? I think it is never un uh, it's never un Jesus Christ. It's never unpinned. Okay. So I, I wrote I had the same question. I wrote a quick function that didn't confirmation do anything, right there. And it was still not unpinned. So I think all async functions are uh, not, not unpinned. unpinned. Okay. Yep. Excellent. And I saw a question all the way in the front. This is fun. I'm just gonna bring it over to you personally. Somebody got hit in the head with this thing already. So there we go. So you said you waited five years to look into this. What documentation or other change in Rust would have made this substantially less intimidating? What could we have done better to make this not as terrible? I think the main issue is if you look at the module documentation for PIN, for the PIN module in, in, in STD, um, it is obviously complete and accurate, and uh, but it sort of starts in the middle, right? Um, I was considering actually uh, thinking about maybe uh, as a consequence of this all, um, uh, try to write a better sort of introduction to this module and submit that as a PR. We'll see. Please do. I'd love to review that. Yeah. All right. Anyone else have a question? No? Oh, there, there, there. <laughs> ha ha. This is great. Don't need to go to the gym today. Mouth throwing, there we go. It's not so much a question, but uh, the crate you just pointed to, pin project, actually has a mechanism to implement pin drop, where you get a drop, where you get a pin, a mutual reference. That's so pro our, yes, uh, but that's probably pin project, not pin project light? Yeah, that's pin uh, project. So that's Does one of the cases one? where, yeah, yeah sorry, that, yes. So that's yeah, one so of the cases where you want to do that instead of the. So if you want to have a way to do it without shooting yourself in the foot, use uh, that crate. I think there's also in the documentation for probably the unpin module, uh, the pin module. There's also a, it sort of lines out how you do this by just converting your your mutual reference into a pin into a pin mutable reference. Damn it! All right. Oh, yeah. Derek Young is setting something up, so that that allows me to sneak in another question. There we go. So I feel this is a, a stupid question, but probably going to be laughed at. But the, the example where you introduced the pin crate, I was wondering, couldn't you just use a, a, a trade bound for, uh, uh, for unpin on the yes. implementation? Yeah, I, I guess I forgot to mention that. Yeah, you could do that, but obviously, why would you if you can do this properly? Okay. Yeah. I think in practice, for this particular example, you probably could just get away with it, because all the stream things are probably unpinned, because there's really a reason why, why you wouldn't why it wouldn't be, because, I mean, ultimately, it's just a file descriptor, right? It's just an integer. Um, but, um, yeah, well, I needed an example. <laughs> All right. And thank you very much, Martin.